My name is Adil Najim. I am uh, the Dean of the Pardee School of Global Studies here at Boston University, a long, long time friend and cheerleader for the Sustainable Development Policy Institute in Islamabad, Pakistan. And it is a great pleasure to be with all of you. It is a special pleasure because uh, I am joined by some wonderful people here. But before I go there, I think I should, I, I, I jumped in too fast before Sahar could actually introduce the panel. Sahar, you want to do that? Yes, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. On behalf of STPI and Boston University, I welcome you to the Planetary Dialogue Plenary, the future of sustainable development in the world after coronavirus. I formally welcome our host, Dr. Adil Najam, inaugural dean Frederick S. Purdy School of Global Studies, Boston University, USA. He's also a professor of international relations and of earth and environment. Earlier, he served as vice chancellor of the Lahore University of Management Sciences in Lahore, Pakistan, and as the director of Boston University for the Center. His research focuses on issues of global public policy, especially those related to global climate change, South Asia, Muslim countries, environment and development, and human development. He was co-author for the third and fourth assessments of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for which the scientific panel was awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for advancing the public understanding of climate change science. In 2010, he was awarded the Sitara Intiaz Star of Excellence, one of Pakistan's highest civil awards by the President of Pakistan. In 2019, he was appointed to the Prime Minister of Pakistan's Advisory Council on Foreign Affairs. Dr. Najim, was, uh, Dr. Najim has written over 100 scholarly papers and book chapters. His recent book include South Asia 2060, Envisioning Regional Futures. He was also the lead author for the 2017 Pakistan National Human Development Report on Youth. I also welcome our honorable guests joining us from Africa, Ecuador, India, New York, and Nairobi. Now I hand over the session to Dr. Adil Najam so we may begin the proceedings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sahar. Thank you very much for embarrassing me with reading that 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 bio. My my real introduction is that I am a friend of the Sustainable Development Policy Institute, and I have the great honor to be, I hope, a friend of all our wonderful panelists. We have a really stellar panel here. We are calling this not a plenary, but uh, but a planetary, uh, because we have colleagues from across the world who have been looking at the world for a very long time in very serious ways. I am joined uh, from India by Sunita Narayan, one of the founders of the Center for Science and Environment, the editor of Down to Earth, and one of the most passionate voices for sustainable development for a long time, as are all of my, as are all of my guests. Uh, I am delighted to be joined by Yolanda Kakabatse, uh, former president of WWF, former president of IUCN, former minister of environment of Ecuador, and all of those those are less important than her deep passion and commitment to the cause of conservation uh, across the world. I am delighted. Uh, we are also joined by Alice uh, Ruveza, who joins us from Nairobi in Kenya. She leads WWF uh, in, in, in Africa, but more than that, for a long time, has been working on issues of sustainable development, sustainable food production, and, and environmental justice at large. And finally, I am delighted we are also joined uh, from New York by uh, Professor Sukiko Fukada Par, now a professor at the New School in New York. Before that, a uh, long time in multiple roles with the United Nations, including my favorite as the head and the uh, lead author of the Human Development Reports in the UN. So we have a wonderful panel who have a lifetime of experience, ideas, and passion on the question of sustainable development. And that is our subject today. Our subject is to really try to think about where is sustainable development and where is it likely to be in the world that COVID is already creating for us? Uh, how is it going to be impacted? Are we going to put more attention 
on global issues because now we have lived through a real global crisis? Or have we learned that we are not very good at, at reading signs of incoming catastrophe, that we are not very good at global cooperation? Those are the type of questions. Please raise your questions in the comments. I already see that myself and our participants will try to read them from there. I'll try to bring them in a, into the conversation. We want to have a conversation. But before that, if you allow me two minutes, literally two minutes, as was mentioned, this panel is co-hosted by SDPI and the Sustainable Development Conference and the uh, Party Center for the Study of the Longer Range Future here at Boston University. And at the Party Center in, in March, we started talking to a lot of experts. We ended up with 100. We interviewed 100 global thought leaders on what the world after coronavirus might look like. And all of my guests were part of those interviews. And I want to share with you literally a two minute snippet of some of the things we heard on sustainable development. We made these snippets on various things, on politics, on technology, on life, on health, so on and so forth. But here are some of the things we heard on sustainable development that I want to share with you as, as, as the, uh, at the beginning of, of our conversation. So let me see if I can take you to, uh, to a shared screen, which I hope you see now and that you can hear what our colleagues say. I don't think one can even mention sustainability unless you recognize that ecosystem health equals human health. Humanity is placing too many pressures on the natural world with damaging consequences. What happens in the long term to biodiversity is going to depend on the course of our collapse. We also need to make sure we prioritize a food future that coexists in harmony with nature. The big problem, of course, is that problems of poverty and problems of inequality impinge on the question of food availability. It's now the 21st century and there are still 800 million people worldwide that don't have access to safe and affordable drinking water and over 2 billion people worldwide that don't have access to adequate sanitation services. And even without a pandemic, even without a public health crisis, that is a public health crisis. 75 years from now, we're going to run the world on sun and wind because it's cheap and clean. But if it takes 75 years to get there, the world that we run on sun and wind will be a broken world. We have many opportunities to really transform our economy as we come out of COVID. We need to come back with a cleaner economy. We should be able to make our societies more resilient, grow the number of jobs, and actually grow the security of our energy system. Do we prop up the fossil fuel industry or... Do we, as we did during the recession, choose to make an investment in green technologies? You now have these extraordinary sums of money being mobilized overnight. We could not find it in ourselves for the past 10 years to find a way to mobilize $100 billion in order to accelerate our collective capacity to move towards a low carbon economy. We have another global pandemic, global planetary emergency looming. And can we use this opportunity? Can we learn from this to actually fix the way for the future? The coronavirus pandemic, in my view, is a harbinger of a much, much bigger emergency to come. And everybody is now seeing that. The bottom line is that our recovery from this pandemic must guide us to a more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope that gives you a flavor of some of the things that we were hearing. And I would again urge and request our viewers and everyone to to go and, and watch the others. As I said, we have a, actually 101 of, of these five-minute capsules uh, from various people on where the world is heading, including from each of our panelists. But let me pose the question that was posed there. Um, what do you see? And I'm going to ask this of every one of my guests. What do you see as the future of sustainable development, um, either because or despite the coronavirus uh, um, situation that we are in. So, Nita, can I can I request you to maybe launch us off? What would be your two minute sort of bird's eye view of where we are with sustainable development? You may want to uh, unmute. 
Thank you, Adil. And again, thank you, SDPI, for organizing this with Boston University. Like Adil, I'm also a longtime fan of SDPI, so I'm delighted to be part of this. Um, you know, Adil, I think it's a, it's a very confounding time in the world. Everything that is happening is also not happening. And I think it's important for us to understand how, how complicated the world is today. On the one hand, we have seen disruption like never before. You would have thought that this kind of disruption would make the world stand up and actually think about how interdependent we are, how interconnected we are, and actually get world leaders to work together, whether it is on COVID, whether it's on vaccine, whether it's on understanding that if the poor in the world do not get the, do not get water, do not get uh, those services, the world will remain vulnerable, but we don't see it happening. On the other hand, the same thing with sustainable development. I mean, on the one hand, we have a crisis of local air pollution in our part of the world. We know, and we are acting. I see a lot of action happening because of the outrage that I'm seeing against pollution. And I'm seeing, therefore, action being taken, not as transformative as we would like it, but I see action being taken. It's the same with climate change. We know that the impacts of climate change are hurting us today. The poor in the world are beginning to see the impact of climate change. We know that this is not, not only the poor, but also the rich world is affected. Whether it's the fires in California, fires in Australia, the uncertain extreme weather that we are seeing across the world. Action is happening. But the point, and I think the question that you should be asking today is not about whether we are acting on sustainable development, but whether we are acting at the scale and pace that is needed today. And I think that's the appropriate question. And for that, I would certainly say no. We still don't have the imagination, the courage, and the boldness to take the kind of action that we need to take in the face of this calamity. Yolanda, same question to you, and if you can unmute also, do we have the imagination? Why, or, and if Sunita is right, why, why don't we have the imagination and the boldness, despite now nearly a quarter of a century of, 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 of trying to grapple with this, this question? I mean, the accumulated wisdom on this screen itself, why, why aren't we where we thought we might have been, if that is the case? Uh, Adil, mm, I, I don't think we are explaining to people what it really means in a language that people can understand. The very exclusive group of people who, who know what's happening and who can visualize the future and who understand these processes um, do it because they are uh, educated in that field. But the rest of the world has no idea of what we're talking about. If you ask a citizen walking along the street if they can explain what is climate change, no. If uh, even simple words like biodiversity, some people cannot explain. So what I see today, Adil, is that um, people are now beginning to understand with COVID that the relationship, for example, between the health of the ecosystem and the health of the planet is one. And, and not using those terms, but just identifying deteriorated land next to cities and towns and in places where people live and say, can you see this? Can you see this? This is the cause of. Uh, but, but it means uh, delivering the message in a different language, speaking in a much simpler vocabulary that can bring people together and understand. And I see this happening in some places. In my region, for example, in Latin America, where ecosystems are highly deteriorated for food production, for example, the harm of excessive food production and, and, and uh, sharing the information that the third of the food produced goes to waste, that has an impact. 
And that is a way to lead the conversation into sustainable development. But through something that touches every day's life, that touches a fiber of the, of the human being who, who is affected or doesn't want to be affected by, by these changes. Alice, can I bring the same question to you? Sustainable development, where are we? And if we are not where we want it to be, why are we not there? So thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's hard actually to follow both uh, Sunita and Yolanda. They are very, they've been very eloquent. In my view, I think where we, where we are, where we want to be depends on where we were in the first place. And it's really three things here. It's where the pre-COVID states, how the impacts of COVID affected you and what measures you have put in place. And when I look around, I see pre-COVID, I look at the sustainable development uh, goals report last year, showing long-term negative trends on poverty, on inequality, on food security, on malnutrition climate change, nature loss, wildlife trafficking and, and biodiversity loss. We were already there before COVID came. And now with COVID, with COVID-19, really we are just going downward, you know, global output shrinking, global poverty headcount, 100 million people inequality. That is a big one, you know. Um, look at the remarkable mismatches, you know, those jobs, the nurses, the low wage jobs and the ones that are really highly impacted, the school closures and how they affected those with no access to inter internet. Climate emissions, yes, we've seen some gains there because and some nature recovery, but at the same time, when you look at the recent reports coming out, 2020 is the warmest year on record. Governance, the absence, absence of a properly coordinated international mechanism on vaccine. So for me, where we go depends on where we were in the first place, on whether we are able to minimize the damage that has been caused, recover quickly from that damage, and also build further on the things that we've put in place and really sustain those positive gains. And in the continent where I live at the moment, we were not there yet. We never were there and COVID has just left us worse off. Thank you. Sakiko, so that's a that's a amazing table that's been set for you. Uh, in in some ways, um, I listen to our colleagues and think that at least in the terms of how we speak about it, we talk about sustainable development much more than we ever expected we would. You know, we talk the language of sustainable development goals when we can when we connect on climate. The whole world leadership shows up, but. Is there a disconnect or are we in fact not seeing the progress? But where do you see sustainable development to, to, to launch us off before we go? Well, you know, um, just I think the last international meeting I went to before the um, coronavirus um, hit the world in its full glow um, was a meeting in um, Bergen, Norway, where uh, about inequality and sustainable development, and we were um, the the the, the um, head of the chair of the Secretary General's expert group that was commissioned to review the um, review progress in uh, 2019 presented their findings. Um, and it was not a very nice um, report in, the, in, in terms of the progress being made. I mean, warning that unless something is done uh, to reverse course, uh, we will not make, be making progress. Um, and at that time, the big thing that they pointed out was the problem of inequality, where things are going backwards and that inequality was going to prevent the progress. That is to say the SDGs, for example, cannot be achieved without the goal to reduce inequality. And you know, now that seems like a very long time ago, but it's a sort of a reality check that during the pandemic, in fact, um, people have kept saying that the pandemic is exposing all the fractures of uh, society nationally, locally, and globally. And yet we know that the most astonishingly, 
uh, Jeff Bezos is, uh, he, he is the head of Amazon, who is, I think, the wealthiest person in the world and has a wealth, according to The Guardian, of 1.89 billion, um, uh, 189 billion. Well, his wealth actually increased by 74 billion during this time, a time when m hundreds and thousands of millions of people have gone into unemployment or lost their livelihoods. And, and yet, and, I, and I, I think that we recognize this is a problem. But what, what is distressing is that nothing is actually being done to, to about it. And I, I think that, um, you know, the failure of um, the international community to deal with the longer term, not just um, longer term developmental, social, economics, environmental sustainability consequences of the pandemic is really quite stark. In previous, I remember during the 2008 financial crisis, for example, the G20 came together very quickly to say that there has to be some sort of a response and a rescue package, that the international community has done virtually nothing about the debt, the mounting debt of the low-income countries uh, the experience that we have with uh, the vaccines, I think, shows the failure, for example, to support South Africa's um, proposal at the WTO to lift some of the provisions of the TRIPS agreement to make um, vaccines and other treatments available. Um, the hoarding of these vaccines by the developed uh, by the developed countries, this thing called vaccine nationalism. I think I think it's a very tragic situation of our collective failure. So I, I was hoping one of you would in, in some hope, but Sunita <laughs> tells us we are doing things. Actually, Sunita is probably the most hopeful, at least in the beginning. She says, you know, there are things happening, but they're not happening at scale. Uh, Yolanda tells us uh, we think about it, but we don't, we haven't discovered a language uh, to connect to real people on. And Alice tells us where we go is depends uh, where we will go. It depend on where we are coming from and where we are coming from is not a very healthy place. And, and, and uh, um, Sakiko calls it tragic. So <laughs> let me throw this back at you. Anyone, uh, <laughs> Yolanda, Yolanda wants to say something. I just want to give something positive in Please. a deal, a very small issue, but very large implications. And that is this exchange is reaching hundreds of people. So COVID has democratized discussions, conversations, <laughs> events that used to be for the very privileged ones like us who could afford the ticket, the hotel, the per diem, whatever. And it was for a hundred people and that was it. Now it's thousands of people taking place and listening and learning and discussing something that they had never access to. And I'm so happy about that. A deal that I had to share it with you. I am glad you do. I'm glad you do. I, uh, this brings us right to where I want it to be, which is what is to be done, which is what is to be done. Right, in, in, we have this amazing moment when we've had a truly global crisis. Like now we know what a global crisis looks like as if we didn't before. And our response has in some cases maybe been uplifting, in many cases it isn't. But if we could do it all over again, as Sunita was saying in that video, you know, there is another crisis coming, we know that. What do we learn from this that we can apply to that? You know, Zoheb Rauf asked in the questions whether we are in the discovery phase or design phase, and I am anxious to get to the action phase. Mm -hmm. But in the action phase, Sunita, what, what should we be doing or what should we have been doing? So, you know, taking off also from what Yolanda said, and I think pointing to where I think there are opportunities that we have seen because of COVID. I mean, COVID has been a very tough time and I think the disproportionate impact on the poor in the world is just, it's just appalling. But I think there are also lessons that we have learned. And I think in the subcontinent, we have learned much sharper lessons, which we should be taking forward. One, when COVID happened in my part of the world, that is in India, 
we had massive migration out of our cities back to the villages. We found that there was a huge number of what, were, what you could at best call invisible workers in our cities who were leaving our cities because there was complete collapse of livelihood and people had no option but to go back to their villages. And in some level, what you saw now was not only the invisible becoming visible, but you also saw what was happening till now was that with every, uh, we have, you know, with every rural agrarian distress in uh, situation, with climate change impacts making it worse, you were seeing massive internal displacement happening with people leaving villages to come to cities. Now they were going back, they have gone back. And the question that this raised to us and continues to raise, and I don't think we're giving adequately proper answers to it, but still we need to keep talking about it. One, what does this do to the, to the future of work in our countries? What does it do to the future of production in our countries? Let's take the question of production. The fact is whether it's the climate change crisis or whether it's the air pollution crisis, its root is in the production, global production systems, which have been designed to discount the cost of labor and discount the cost of environment. It is no surprise, should be no surprise, and Mr. Larry Summers had pointed this out to us and should not be any surprise, that production moved to China, to uh, Bangladesh, to India, to wherever else, where the cost of production could be discounted through the cost of environment. In my city, every time we crack down on a legal industrial estate for pollution control, production moves to where there is no regulation, where there is an unauthorized area, where the cost of labor can be discounted, the cost of production and environmental controls can be discounted. That's the crisis, environmental crisis today. Now, what COVID did is to basically point this out to us very clearly that number one, if the people, and in India this has happened, if people have gone back home, here is an opportunity to reinvest in rural resilience. Here is an opportunity to rebuild conditions in which they leave only the, if they want to leave, not because they have to leave. And you can create a resilient rural environment in which you basically reinvent what you mean by agriculture, what you mean by conservation. I mean, in India, we have followed this ridiculous British German tech, uh, conservation ethic in which either we know how to cut or we know how to conserve. We don't know how to cut and regrow and cut again. We don't know how to put the money in the hands of the poor. We don't know how to build economies of the poor based on natural resources. So that's an opportunity we have. The other part, we have an opportunity and we are doing, and in fact, it's happening right now, Adil, because labor has become so scarce in urban areas today and industry today that, in, uh, that the employers are now starting to talk about what's a better housing condition we can give, what are better healthcare facilities we can give. Government is talking about affordable housing for labor today. That will all raise the cost of production. People like me are talking about the cost of environmental protection. So all that will raise the cost of pro uh, production. Now, the big challenge for our countries is to say, okay, it raises the cost of production. Okay, we become uncompetitive with China, but we will keep doing what is right for our people. We will keep investing in environment. We will keep investing in labor because we are going to build a more well-being oriented economy, not a wealth oriented economy. I think COVID has asked those questions. And I'm beginning to see some glimmers of it in policy today. The Indian government is talking about rural resilience. Indian government is talking about how to reinvest and how to do things for labor. But the, this is really what COVID demands of us, what climate change demands of us. If you don't move out of a consumption-oriented growth, there is no way that you can combat climate change. Let's just forget it. It's nice talk, nice for us to come and meet. It's a little late in the evening to be polite, however. <laughs> but but I, I think we have, a, we have a theme here and we've got some very good questions coming that I want to come to, including one from my friend, uh, Maria Ivanova, 
about uh, about what universities and and I would say also civil society, if I can add to that, can do. But but to stay on this theme for a minute, uh, Sakiko, if I can come to you, if the theme is use COVID as an opportunity to rethink how we do things. What do you see at that global UN level, for example, of where are the, the opportunities for rethink, if you will? Well, I think the, you know, I, I, I think that the, um, my comment may not be terribly practical um, or pragmatic, but what I think the COVID crisis shows is the need for a different kind of multilateralism. And uh, because um, the COVID has sort of upended all our assumptions about the different ways in which countries are able to tackle crises and the way that crises affect different countries. So um, actually the, co uh, the, the pandemic has hit the high income countries more severely in terms of uh, mortality and cases than uh, low and middle income countries. I mean, particularly low income countries, African countries have remarkably low mortality rates, like in single digits or in the hundreds, as opposed to uh, like in the United States, you know, in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and the, the, the Asian countries also have done very well, um, many of them. Um, so that leaves you to think, what is the knowledge and the capacity that is valuable for challenging the, uh, for coping with crisis? What kind of human and social, societal resources do you need? I think it just raises all kinds of questions. Um, and the and then, as I said, in a very negative way, the, uh, the uh, very sad way in which the World International Community has not actually uh, stepped up to really deal with the um, uh, inequities in, in terms of wealth and financial resources of, of countries, that, that the, the developing countries are essentially going to be very hard hit by the economic fallout of the pandemic, um, but it is curious how um, many of the low-income countries have perhaps managed the pandemic better. And, and, and a lot of people say, you know, oh, African countries report low death rates because they don't keep data well. Well, yes, but you can't hide, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who, who are dying. You, you couldn't do that with Ebola. So there's no way you can do it with, with this. And when I asked my friends in Africa, so why is it that Burkina Faso has had so few deaths? You know, my friend says, oh, first of all, the government took very quick action. Um, so um, I think that it sort of, I'm just giving these as sort of simple anecdotal examples of the way that I think the, that um, the relations amongst countries will change in the international community. Um, and, you know, I, I think this is a sort of a trend that was coming anyway. Um, the he hegemon, you know, the United States uh, uh, as a hegemon, for example, is kind of no longer going to be there. There's, there'll be a sort of a vacuum. So I, I think the international community will have to rearrange itself to find the sort of leadership necessary to deal with these uh, these problems. I'm very glad you brought this up because this was brought up by a number of our panelists in the video series I was talking about that in some ways, you know, once this is over, we will reconsider what resilience means. Yes. And some of our notions of where strength and resources are will need to be reconsidered. We will need to reconsider where power lies, where, exp where knowledge lies even. Right, and, and I think that's one of the roles we can play. Uh, Alice, before I come back to uh, Yolanda, uh, your thoughts on this, where are the opportunities for rethink in this moment of COVID? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, lots of, lots of opportunities. Uh, you know, I, I didn't mean to be all negative. I should have said, 
I think I see actually do see COVID as an opportunity for all of us to take a critical look at all our systems. And um, when I look at a place like Africa, where I come from, look at the youth, this is going to be the youngest population going forward. So when we talk about reconvening the leadership, I see an opportunity now to let them lead, put them in leading places and start, let them start thinking. Other, other areas where Africa has done amazingly well that I want to talk about that are also, well, there are areas like renewable energy and leapfrogging technology. Those are areas that we, we need to look at because when you look at the jobs that are created, the jobs created for renewable energy are much higher than any other. In fact, I think the figure, the figure is about, oh, I don't have, I, I think it's about three times as many jobs created per 1 million invested in renewable energy rather than fossil fuels. And for us, then when you look at places where you have these wind and solar, then you're seeing some opportunities there. Another one that's very close to my heart, and I spoke about this before when we talked, is the one around our traditional vegetables, our traditional foods uh, grown on family farms and nourished us for many years. Now that the supply chains have broken with COVID and we're no longer importing this food, from abroad, I mean, Africa has been our biggest importer of food. We can now start looking at our traditional food that has been a part of our culture and cuisine for many, many years. And, uh, and really, there's a lot of data showing that when you shift diets towards local community, food, local traditional foods, you reduce the dependency on polluting fertilizers and pesticides, and you reduce waste, and you reduce all the food-related greenhouse gas, gas emissions. We talked about rural areas. I fully agree with Sunita, even, even here for us. The revitalizing of rural areas, those opportunities are important and we need to look at them. And maybe the last one is really the nature-based designs for health, something maybe we hadn't thought about. Yes, we are going to continue to struggle with limited hospital bed capacity and low access to all kinds of things that we need. But at the same time, there are some good examples where there's architecture that is built to heal as there's places, hospitals that are near these green, green spaces where people have actually recovered just from looking at, so looking at the healing, op healing opportunities that come from nature. So the, lots of opportunities there are, and uh, I, yeah, I'm, I am positive. I am positive that there are some opportunities we can now look at. Thanks. In a way you have, you know, very, very succinctly, all of you have raised a very interesting agenda for sustainable development, if you will, you know, rethink the, the, what we mean by rural, the invisible worker that Sunita was talking about. Um, rethink outreach as Yolanda was talking about, you know, it's no longer experts in, in hotel rooms talking to each other. Uh, rethink multilateralism, which I think is being going to be forced upon us. And it's up to us whether we rethink it in a constructive way or just let it fall apart. Uh, and, and then rethink the very local, rethink food. You know, we have a wonderful question there from Zagam Habib, which is partly answered by what Alice was saying. But, but on this, re I want to stick to the rethinking theme because I must confess, after three decades, I'm tired of just pointing out what's wrong. Uh, I want to agitate for that which is right, which can be better. And so in that spirit, uh, Yolanda, if I take uh, Maria Ivanova's question, but also broaden it, what would be your charge to those, let's say, in academia or in civil society? What does this moment call upon us to do? We could talk about that for hours, I think. But some of the key questions um, or key issues that I have seen as very positive, Adil, uh, is um, the discovery or rediscovery of the connectivity between rural and urban people. Uh, urban people used to depend on the supermarket, on the pharmacy that is a very large multinational chain, um, on the hardware store and whatever. And suddenly, this COVID allows us to discover because someone rings the bell in your door and say, I have fresh potatoes. Would you like to buy some? And my tomatoes are the best in the world. Can I bring them over to your home or fruit or anything? Anything of the family farmers that have been so apart from the urban world of today, and that suddenly are recovered their, their value, and that are discarded 
making reference to that person who spoke about a, a food waste. It, that, that food that is discarded by the large chains, by the large supermarkets who want perfectly looking food, which is usually tasteless. And so we discover these people and we become friends and suddenly we are visiting each other and learning how they produce and why I would like to continue uh, eating that food instead of going back to the supermarket again. Another beautiful thing that has sprung up of this moment and which I believe Adil is part of sustainable development is solidarity. Suddenly you find neighbors being solidarians, people who have someone in hospital who count on uh, the vicinity or people that they never even looked at or considered being supportive, generations being supportive. Suddenly we discover that young people are desperate, that we need to do something for those youngsters school age and the children need the support of a different kind because the teacher cannot provide it through a screen and the elderly need to, to, to have other options of connectivity, but also a sort of solidarity between nations and with a planet. We have discovered that that planet is the one that is feeding us, that will guarantee good or bad health a good or bad water. Latin America, that is the richest continent in water, is so poorly managing its water resources that we are opening our eyes and saying, so how are we going to prepare for future risks? As Sunita was saying, the next virus or the next crisis is round the corner. And we need, well, that is also positive. We discovered that we are not prepared and that we need to prepare better our institutions, our minds and, and people to be better prepared and uh, deal with a new mess in a much better way than the one that, than how we have addressed this crisis. Uh, and this is, I don't know if this is for Sunita or for Sekiko or for all of you, I'll start with anyone here. I see solidarity. I see my neighbor bringing food and there is sort of suddenly this localness that is, that, that is embraced and that is very, very um, uplifting. But I don't see the global coming together. Uh, no. I see people putting borders. You can't have my mask because, you know, even, even Germany saying to, to Italy, I can't share my masks with you because I don't, I may not have enough countries holding up on vaccines as Sakiko was talking about. Can what? I, can I interrupt you there? I, I think that solidarity is absent, but I think it's because of uh, the absence of leaders, of global leaders who have a vision that is much broader than their own locality. And Sunita, maybe maybe you, what will it take to bring those leaders or, or that leadership, more than leaders, yeah. the leadership? Yeah. Uh, what, what will it take? Do you see signs of hope or do you see opportunities for action in that direction? Very tough. I mean, as I said, it's a very confounding time. Think about it. I mean, at one time, exactly what Yolanda said, it's well said it so beautifully. You're seeing such humanity um, at the local level, but you're seeing such discordant leadership at the national and global level. I mean, leaders are polarizing societies, dividing societies, you know. I mean, if I was to put it, and I can do that because Adil, you're the only man in this panel, and I can be- I, I am sorry. <laughs> I can be a little, uh, I mean, it's a very masculine uh, leadership in the world right now. Everybody sort of is out there saying, you know, we're just going to go out there. And I think we, we are creating, um, we're not creating the right conditions for good leadership. And the more divided our societies get, and I think that's where in some level, we have to also talk about the, how the very tools of democracy, 
I mean, things that we just, you know, whether it's social media, the tools of democracy are actually undermining democracy in our countries. And, and, and why is it that our democracy is getting more and more, um, you know, um, weaker and hollowed out? Um, and, and in some senses, what the virus is, is all about a much more sort of, you know, if, if you're an authoritarian government, the virus also listens to you. If you're a democratic government, you know, the virus doesn't listen to you. I think it's a, it's a failure of leadership, but I think there is something about this that, and Adil, it does concern me from South Asia, from India, that in some senses, democracy is today becoming an elitist uh, idea, an elitist project. And we need to be concerned about it because in my view, the beginning of COVID and the reason for COVID or as I'm in the middle of this honey scandal that I've just, we've just unearthed it, it's all about democracy. It's all about the role that we have to play to hold um, uh, to, to play that role, to make sure that we can, you know, uh, talk to power and talk truth to power. Uh, but it's a tougher and tougher world for, uh, for, uh, for all of us. And I think that is, that does, should concern us tremendously. I, I want to pass this on to Sakiko, but also to highlight for our um, viewers and listeners, uh, do please go to the Down to Earth website in uh, that uh, Sunita's organization has on, on the work they're doing on honey that she just referred to. And I, I think it's a story about so many things. It's a story about capitalism. It's a story about ecology. It's a story about science. It's a story about democracy, as you put it. And it's a story pertinent to many places. I will also say that uh, you mentioned about women in leadership. One of the things we do seem to see causal or not, where we have women leaders, we seem to have had a better a uh, better response that the leadership of care seems to have been much more effective than the leadership of fear, mm. uh, of putting up walls and putting up, uh, uh, and, and, and I hope lessons are learned in that uh, in a deeper way, but I, like Sunita, have my worries about directionship of both democracy and leadership, but Sakiko, you wanted to jump in, please do. There is um, what can be done at the local level, but at the global level, I think that there is a, um, a systemic problem um, because the pandemic is coming to a world of hyper-globalization and finance capitalism. And there's a question there from Richard Rosen. You can't talk about what to do without addressing the pros and cons of capitalism. And, you know, the, 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 at the grassroots, people are doing all kinds of things and showing their humanity and solidarity and trying to solve problems and showing care <laughs> as opposed to fear. But at this sort of at the top level of national leadership and at the leadership of uh, the business community, I don't see that sort of um, commitment to um, universalism to global concern for humanity and so forth. And the system of uh, a global economy that we have, which we label as finance capitalism, is extremely corrosive to both democracy and economic stability and to redistribution, uh, equitable growth. And, and the example I gave of uh, Jeff Bezos and others practically doubling their wealth during the, this time is not an accident because the economy, the global economy works in such a way that wealth begets wealth. And, it's, and, and the economy is not something that comes from heaven, you know, like manna from heaven. It is something that is man-made or person-made uh, by the rules of, uh, uh, of, of international agreements regarding trade and investment and things of that kind and various other standards. So I think we do have to do something about economic models and um, international treaties in order to reverse the inequalities, reverse check the 
power of special interests uh, and give back democracy, not only in the political sphere, but in the economic sphere. Uh, Alice, can I bring the same to you? Um, and including especially because we have a number of people in our audience who are asking questions about food, because in, in, in many ways, you know, food is always central. But this crisis has also made the centrality of that very, very personal. Uh, but, but please take this anywhere. Where, where do you see the leadership or uh, coming in, in terms of sustainable development? I want to bring it back to that too, sort of, are, are we seeing any change or are we not? Um, yeah, very, it's a tough question. I, I did mention earlier that I, I actually think that we, we are always taught that anyone can lead. Right, it doesn't have to be always at the top, and that's why I mentioned earlier that the youth, that maybe we need to empower the youth. But it also brings me to that uh, word that Yolanda used, the word about language. Uh, what language are we using to describe these things? Because I think we need to make if we make the language simpler and accessible, then we can have more people leading because more people understand this. We can have citizens holding their governments accountable for certain things because they understand. But I think that by using these difficult words such as biodiversity and others, we have, we have made some of the things we do inaccessible. And then they've, and they've remained in the hands of a few people who can only talk about them and lead about them. But, that, but again, as Yolanda said, it's nice that now everybody's on Zoom. And so all we have to do is democratize this, make it more accessible, more understandable, and then we'll have more people leading. I think one point I also wanted to make about COVID-19 is the fact that I think it has also shown that the public health in one country is also important to another country. I, and it was, the point was made earlier that, you know, as much as the vaccine is gonna be kept in the hands of a few, as much as our health systems may be poor here, it is important that we get that vaccine. And it's important that everybody, even us who live in, the, in, in the low income countries get the vaccine because if we don't, then the, the, the whole world will not get better. The world is, will only get better if the entire, if the vaccine reaches everyone. So I think in many ways, the COVID creates that equalizer that going forward, we need to do. It will force us to do this. It will force us to make, make sure that the vaccine also gets to other places where, where, where it needs to get. And I think for me, I think that that's extremely important. Thanks. I, I want to. Uh, I want to because we're also sort of as the do the countdown back to the close. Uh, I want to keep drilling on this theme of what can we do? What can you know? We are being watched right now by a number of students. The question of youth you brought up, others have brought up, is very important. I often talk about it, but on the other hand, I also see you know at least in the U.S. this young generation, at least on its Amazon footprint, is more consumptive than any other young generation ever because everything is delivered in a box, right? And, and therein lies also opportunities, uh, but it is also the most, uh, most passionately involved generation in terms of environmental issues, at least in this country, because the level of understanding is higher, the level of commitment is higher. So I'm trying to grapple here for those opportunities that all of you are talking about. Uh, you know, uh, to throw this as a question, in that video, we heard Akim Steiner, who all of you know, uh, sort of uh, lament about how difficult it was to think about $10 billion for climate. And then COVID comes and within two days, you know, a trillion dollar appears here and is all spent in two weeks and, and billions appear there. And so in some ways, is that a good lesson that in fact, the resources are there, that things we thought were very difficult can be done? Or is it the lesson that it wasn't coming for sustainable development because there really isn't the commitment for it? And, and, and when someone hit us, something hit us that was big, then the money came in. So I, I know I've babbled a lot, but anyone wants to pick this up? I mean, what will it take? I, I keep coming back to this question. Help us think through what our audience can do to, 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 to use this moment to rethink sustainable development. Alice, you seem to want to come in. Yeah, I think Yolanda also wanted to come in. And I'll just make one, one little point. Again, for me, it's gonna be about the framing. So um, health, uh, COVID is, was a health problem, right? And everybody jumped in because we all want to remain alive. 
And is it be, could it be because we have not framed all our other things around that same, the shared agenda? Uh, have we made biodiversity an elite agenda? Have we made, and yet health remains, health, food, as you mentioned earlier, health and food, those are shared agendas and everybody understands them. And if somebody says I'm hungry or I'm dying, everybody will come in. But I think that all the other things we want to, to deal with, whether it's climate change, uh, they also are, they are also the same. They have the same issue. Is it? It may be the way we are framing, and this is why I like the the point about language that Yolanda mentioned earlier, and I really truly believe in that. That maybe we need to frame these problems in, in a different way, because uh, because yeah, they are all shared agendas, and they all do have implications for health and also for food. Over. Very, very good. I'll I'll go to Yolanda if again one one sentence if you allow me. I'm reminded by what you said of a paper written 30 years ago. At least some, you will recognize it, which my students still are made to read, called "Climate Change as If People Mattered." And Sunita, because she was she was she was one of the authors. Apart from what's in the paper, just that framing of climate change. Yes. For many of us was a transfor transformational moment that we have to think of this not as molecule management, but as human development. But Yolanda, you wanted to jump in, please. I'm involved in the food summit, in the preparation of the food summit. But for the last uh, maybe five, six, seven years, I've been struggling, fighting and speaking about food loss and waste. And I find that out of, out of this crisis, lots of people are looking into their food waste. Uh, they, there is a lot of time at home to reflect about what's going on. And especially young people are discussing, how can, be, how can I better plan for what I need during the week and use what I have bought and, and share? There is a lot of sharing going on. But what is most important is that when, especially young people, hear that 800 million people go to sleep tonight with no food, they do react because it touches something. It's so simple. Food is something that touches your inner vibes. And it makes you realize that um, solidarity is in play, that uh, sustainability is in play, that uh, climate change is in play, biodiversity and everything, without speaking about those things, that they immediately learn the relation and the connectivity between food and everything else. So I do see, um, and I, I'm proud um, to see the results in the UK, they have decreased 27% of food waste in this, in this year, in just one year, because of a campaign to tell people, do you know what's happening with food? Do you know that the third of food never reaches the consumer? Do you know that, this, uh, um, that so many people are hungry? And, and so I, I tell this story because I think we need to go down to earth with the difficult issues, make them simpler because they touch you in the everyday life and realize, in, and we need to be aware how, a, how every individual can become an activist when they know what is happening and how much they can do and how much it can affect them. There are others who couldn't care, but little by little, it is a contagious, um, theme to to bring more people together. Over. Sunita, you had your... Yeah, just, you know, I, now that Alice and Yolanda have started, I think it's a, you know, food is really something that I think does touch a lot of people. And, you know, Yolanda talked about how we need to bring the messages back into what people can understand. And food is a very good way of doing so. But when I look at it and I, you know, you talked about our honey work and because it's so, it's happening in my life every minute right now, it's, it's very intense. I mean, the big issue for us is that if bees disappear, then pollinators disappear. And for us, therefore, the question is about biodiversity of bees. But 
you know, this is where the irony and some of the sort of the issues come out. So the United, I mean, the European Union, which I do believe is one of the, you know, is always at the forefront of a lot of the environmental challenges and biodiversity challenges, defines honey as one that is produced by one kind of bee, Apis mellifera. And it says that any other bee cannot produce the honey that we will eat. Now, what does it do about biodiversity? So here you have the champion of biodiversity telling me that only Apis mellifera can produce the honey that is sold in EU. Did they ask the other bees? So what happens to, yeah, did they ask the other bees? What happens to the Indian bee, the, you know, Apis dorsetta or the Apis serana? I mean, what happens to our bees? So I think, you know, I, I and, and, you know, when it comes to food, I love my work on food because it really brings out this whole issue about, so we have this massive campaign against junk food. So it's very easy to talk about food and sustainable food, but the minute you start talking about junk food, nobody wants controls on it. The young people do not want controls on junk food. Governments don't want control on salt, sugar, and fat. Industry opposes it. So I think it's important for us, and I think Sakiko talked about it, and I think you know, we should not sidestep these issues. These are some very tough issues that our countries are facing today in terms of uh, corporate control over decision-making. And to me, and the reason I have hope is when I talk about corporate, corporate control over coal, or I talk about it over diesel, it's a little difficult for people to understand. But the minute I talk about corporate control over the honey that we are eating, it's easier to understand. And I think that's where the possibility of bringing change is as well. I think that is brilliant. And I hope our, our listeners are getting this. You know, for me also, I, mean, I, I may be doing this all, all the time as my academic job, but biodiversity, for example, is something out there. Mm. You know, it's, a, it's a technical thing out there. Honey is something on my dining table. It is something I pick up and eat. And so we need to make this personal to ourselves and to those it is impacting, like, like on food. But uh, Sakiko, you wanted to jump in and also say whatever you wanted to, but also if I can bring us, uh, if you can help us bring us to the question of SDGs, right? So, so where are the sustainable development goals in all of this? Are they a ray of bright light or are they a slogan, whichever you want to? To go to. So, you know, I wanted to add to something like food, the question of work and wages and workers, because um, sustainability for me isn't just environment, it's, it's also social and economic. And um, this pandemic has really hit the workers uh, more than the shareholders, right? And um, the garment industry is a very good illustration of this. When the pandemic hit, there was a huge economic consequence, demand shrank, orders were canceled. What happened to the workers? Well, the brands, the corporate brands refused to pay for the orders that they canceled, but that the workers had actually worked to produce. And it was really, um, but this is the uh, silver lining, uh, Adil, since you want the what can we do story. Um, the, there was a massive civil society response and the civil society campaign called Pay Up put a lot of pressure in naming and shaming these, uh, these brands um, that uh, refused to pay up. And so um, there was actually quite um, a direct impact and many of the brands did renegotiate their uh, payments and so forth. And by the way, when I say renegotiate, um, many of these brands actually had uh, contracts that said that they would pay, but then they ori their original contracts um, you know, uh, said that they were supposed to pay in cases of cancellation, but they then evoked force majeure, which again shows you the kind of power that is in the hands of the corporations or other employers who can bring up all kinds of expert legal advice, uh, as opposed to the small um, factory 
in uh, India or Bangladesh or Indonesia or Cambodia or wherever, that is much less able to play those um, games in the, uh, in, in the legal field. So um, I think that what we need uh, is very frankly unions. And you know, th this, there's no way that individuals can solve all their problems on their own. I mean, you do need these alliances of workers and um, uh, collective uh, efforts to renegotiate these, uh, these terms. So I, I do think that the world desperately needs to tame capitalism with more institutionalized checks um, on the social, environmental, and economic impacts. Um, and, you know, th this is very much in line with the SDGs. The SDG agenda, the collection of 17 goals, is actually a very comprehensive package. I mean, obviously, perhaps not comprehensive enough, but a pretty wide scope package of ways to check the natural tendency for capitalism to eat itself up. And um, all of these goals are really a sort of a set of norms that constrain you to say, yes, you know, you have to worry about inequality. You have to worry about oceans. You have to worry about biodiversity. You have to worry about health. And these are not things that you achieve through the free market. These are things that you achieve through some sort of collective uh, consensus and um, public, uh, the, the provision of public goods, the regulation and so forth. Alice, any thoughts from you? And then I want to go to a, 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 actually three very quick rapid fire rounds of questions for everyone. But, but Alice, thoughts on you, including on SDGs, because I, I, I hope our viewers are getting the sense from all of you that you know, policies is, or sustainable development is not just about how you draw a diagram, three circles, four circles, 17 goals or whatever. It is about making issues real, whether you do it with food waste or with honey or with uh, garments, it's, it's, it's about livelihoods. And unless we as scholars and activists can translate those ideas into this level of actual activity, uh, these efforts will not go places. But, but Alice, any thoughts from you? And then I, I hope you will indulge me in a, in a few rapid fire rounds. It all starts and ends with people, isn't it? That's what we are saying here. It's, uh, I like that what you said, climate change as if people mattered. It's all about- Anita and in Ilagarwal, it's, it was their, 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 their epic making paper. I think, yeah, it, it is really all about people. So it's that social contract when Sarkiko talks about wages, when uh, we talk about language, the changes that are going to be needed to be made are going to be made by people. And where will we make them? We will make them if we understand that the things that we need to do matter and we know what, what they are, like Yolanda said, what are those things that we need to do? So for me, yes, if we can put people at the center and really take our time to understand what it is that people care about and what it is that is going to make them act, I think we will, we will, be, we will be there. And all kinds of people, all kinds of people. It's going to be my child, my daughter, my five-year-old or my 10-year-old, or, or it's going to be, you know, the, the, the wage, the worker, the nurse, everybody, everybody. I, I, we have had a wonderful conversation also going on in the comments. And while we haven't picked specific questions, I hope I've tried very hard and my colleagues have to bring those topics in, whether it's youth as was raised by Momi Salim or, or, or Maria's questions or Richard Rosen's questions. I hope we have covered your ground. As we end, if you allow me and indulge me, please. Uh, I, I want to ask three rapid fire questions that I'll ask of each one of you. And, and you've done those videos, so you probably know what is coming. But my first question, Sunita, I'll start with you and go with all of, all, all of you. Each of these questions requires just one, two lines. First question, uh, you look at the future of sustainable development. What gives you hope? Energy of people, outrage of people, and the knee and the, the voice of the poor. Yolanda, what gives you hope? Like Monsignor Tutu, I'm a prisoner of hope. 
because I see little things every day and these add up into important changes. We, I think very, very often we focus on large uh, um, changes and, and expect them, they won't come. It is the little ones that are together by the people that will make the difference. Alice, what gives you hope? Future of sustainable mm -hmm. development. The youth, because now we have a youth that is awake that is understands that they need to do something now because their future, they need to take control of their future. If we, if we fail continue trusting us, it's not gonna get anywhere. So that gives me hope because I see them awake and I see that they are really going to take, they're going to lead. Sakiko? I uh, want to, I just want to, um, uh, all of the things that have been said already, I would subscribe to also, but I just want to add um, civil society activism, I think, is really uh, going to be the force that can make some changes. Sakiko, let me do the second question, starting with you. I'll flip the question. What, what makes you afraid? Future of sustainable development, what are you afraid well, of? It's sort of authoritarian politics, the anti-democratic politics, and I don't mean necessarily the regimes, but it's at all levels in different countries, the ways in which um, authoritarian leaders can make use of the pandemic to impose further crackdowns and, and reinforce their powers. Alice, what, what are you afraid of when you think about the future of sustainable development? I'm not afraid, I'm hopeful. <laughs> I know that change can happen. It may be slower and incremental as Yolanda said, but actually I'm not afraid. I'm ready to face this one head on. Yolanda, you're a prisoner of hope. What are the fears you want to ward off? I think it slows down um, the lack of ability to translate science into policy. Uh, we need urgently to invest in a new profession that is interpreters, interpreters of science that can turn a 500 page document into one policy proposal for the minister, for the head of state, for the parliamentarians of the world who are there and have no idea of what we are talking about. And that, that uh, gap, that vacuum there is terribly relevant and we need to speed that one up. Sunita, fear. What lack of do? imagination and lack of courage. Mm -hmm. I think for me, that's the biggest. I mean, in everything we're dealing with, whether it is how to manage shit or how to manage air pollution or anything we're dealing with, it's lack of imagination of our technocratic minds today where we are not looking at the reality of our own countries and coming up with courageous answers for the future. That's what really worries me. I, I do have a third question, but if, if you allow me to add mine, I, I worry that the moment will pass uh, mm -hmm. and we might learn the wrong lessons. I, I, I am afraid that we will do the slogan but then convince ourselves that the other problems are too immediate. Mm -hmm. and, and this moment which requires us to sort of be bold, like all of you are saying, courageous in, in Sunita's term, uh, we will convince ourselves, yes, 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 the sustainable development is all very good, but right now we have much more pressing problems. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I confront this throughout my, I've confronted this throughout my career, where uh, no one has ever said sustainable development is not important. I've never met anyone who says that. Uh, that is never the argument. The argument is, yes, yes, this is very important, but right now mm -hmm. I have something much more immediate, something much more pressing. I have an election to win. I have a policy to run through. So that's, that's my fear. Um, Another round, Sunita, if I could start with you, this doesn't need to be as short, but because I think in some ways that we are moving, edging towards our concluding works, uh, words, advice. If, if, you could, if you could be an advisor to anyone you want, the national leaders, international leaders, local leaders, anyone, who would you want to advise and what would be your advice to them 
if the goal is a more sustainable development future for the world? And I'll come with the same question to everyone. Firstly, Adil, I don't want to be an advisor to anyone. <laughs> very clear about that. I've spent 30 years of my life avoiding being in any position where I would be uh, advising anyone. Um, so I think my only advice is always public. It's always open. It's always what we believe, what we say, what we have, what we believe can be done. But, but I maybe think that, as, as words of wisdom, not, not advisor in that sense. But words no, fair enough. I'm, I'm pulling your leg. I'm just saying that it's in that context that, you know, I think, I think my, I, I see Adil, I, I mean, I live in Delhi, as you know, I work here, I work in India. There is too much happening and there is a lot that can and must be done. And I think where I see the need today is to engage much more deeply with the development that happening in our world. I do find that we have all become, we procrastinate, we have become great Twitter and social media activists. We say everything we have to social media and we think the problem has gone away. I think for us in South Asia, in Africa, from two regions I can speak for and I know well, I think for us, the biggest advice is engage with things, with the reality around us. I, I was just speaking before this, Adil, I've just been nominated into uh, something called INSA. INSA is the Indian National Science Academy. It's sort of, you know, the equivalent of the US one. Congratulations. And, and I was asked to speak to the to the to the to the meeting with all the fellows. And for me, the again the advice to scientists is engage, please engage. Every decision we take is a highly scientific, technocratic decision. But we are not seeing enough engagement of being able to understand how we can do things better and then practice on the ground and then stand behind the solutions. I mean, if you want public transport to work, if you want e-buses to work, then somebody is going to have to stand behind that idea and see it through. And that's the engagement we need in our world today. We need to see things happen on the ground and we need many of us to stand behind push, prod, kick, shout, do whatever it takes, but get it happen. To me, that's the big thing that needs to be done. Maybe you should okay. be an advisor. Uh, <laughs> you are to me. I am an advisor to everyone. Yes. <laughs> I'm Alice, gonna... your, your words of wisdom, um, advice, uh, yeah. what ought to be done by whom? It's hard to top that. I, I agree with Sunita. Context is key. You must be in that world. And so if you want, like she said, if you want the bus to work, take the bus and see how that bus goes. Because then you can design actually a solution. Because I think a lot of the time we end up with, the, with the people, people designing things when they don't know how they are. But the important thing about context also is that then you're not going to think one size fits all. If you, it is extremely important to understand things the way that people feel them where they are. So I would say support people where they are understand their context and design their solution for where they are and work with them, design it with them. And I agree with the courage and boldness. I think all those are extremely important that sometimes people won't like what you're going to say. Sometimes they'll pull, pull, push it down. But I think just perseverance, perseverance would be work. Mm -hmm. Sakiko? So I would say keep the eye on the ball, you know, which is to say that a bit like maybe this is another way of saying what you were saying, Adil, that um, the challenges of um, making this world a less broken one, um, challenges of sustainable, de uh, sustainable development requires a systemic change and longer term change. And that's what I mean by keep an eye on the ball. And this crisis is making everybody look, you know, very, look towards short-term band-aid solutions and not at systemic change. And I think that this is um, 
this is the the um, this is the opportunity, um, but it isn't obvious for um, everybody that the the band aid solutions um, will be actually making the long term changes that are going to be necessary. Yolanda, last word to you. What would be your words of wisdom, your advice? Yeah, I. Um, again, I advice I don't think is the right word for I for what I like doing. I love connecting. I love connecting between someone who is doing something here that might help someone else who is there. A person who is searching for an answer and I know that other one can give the answer. And that goes for individuals or for institutions or for processes. It, being able to link one thing to the other in order to demonstrate that it's all connected. Uh, and that has an, in, an incredible impact on the persons who are benefiting from bad connections. Uh, and you suddenly find them coming to you and saying it worked. Thank you for, for making that link. And I think that is, uh, for me, it gives me lots of satisfaction and I am happy to see how things begin to, to work by joining forces. Thank you, thank you everyone. Uh, Yolanda reminds us to connect. Uh, Sunita urges us to engage. Uh, Sakiko uh, uh, highlights to keep, uh, keep an eye on the ball. Uh, not lose sight of that, which is important. And uh, Alice, Alice, Alice implores us to to meet people where they are, uh, to understand them in their reality, because that is the only reality that 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 can be changed. Proof. As I think of this, you know, one of the many things, and and I I found this immensely immensely enriching myself. But one of the many uh, surprises of um, COVID, I think, was how many things that people would have said were impossible became possible how quickly? Mm -hmm. If I had said in February, let's do this in Boston where I am, let's tell three fourths of the people not to drive. <laughs> I would have been laughed out of the room. Yeah. If I would have said, let's take a trillion dollars and send it to people who might have lost their jobs. I, 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 I would have been put into an asylum. <laughs> and yet that happened. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what Yolanda was saying that, you know, neighbors coming in with food happened. Uh, people thinking about food waste happened. And even in the garment story, the solution also happened. So in some ways, I, I, I take it from all of you that one of those things that I take is that, that things that are sometimes um, um, poo-pooed away as not being possible, it is not that they are not possible, it is just that people are not ready to do them. <laughs> and, and this goes back to that courage point that a number of you made, that you have to actually think a little about the absurd. Uh, mm -hmm. If you simply remain within the envelope of the possible, there is no sustainable development within the envelope of the possible. Yeah. To the extent sustainable development exists, it requires us to, 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 to tear apart that, that, that envelope of the possible, uh, not to be entirely, and, and it's not that difficult. The, the, the lesson to me is that it's not necessarily uh, difficult. It is not easy, but it is not impossible. And that is what I take from, from this. So I wanted to thank all of you. Thank you, Sunita. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Sakiko. Thank you, Alice. Someone mentioned uh, they wanted to thank SDPI for having an all-female uh, panel, and I apologies to, my apologies <laughs> to include on that. But the fact is that, you know, I, I just went out to look for the smartest people I knew and people <laughs> I have learned from. Uh, they happen to be women, as they very often happen to be. 
and and i think that recognition itself i think is is all that is enough but i'm really grateful i know how busy all of you are i hope who are listening this will be available in recording i would urge you to listen to it again i will i will certainly make my students listen to it again and and i think you should too there is a tremendous amount of advice here there's a tremendous amount of experience and thought here but most importantly i think what's made my day is that there is a tremendous amount of hope here uh, because that hope is necessary that 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 hope hope is not the same as just being optimistic for the sake of it uh, yeah. hope is what keeps the fire of action alive and i i i am grateful to all of you uh, for sharing that hope with us